several characteristics of right speech that apply to right thinking as well. You want your thoughts to be true. They represent things as they are. And you want your thoughts to be beneficial. They actually help you. This is where the Buddha gets into the area of what's called performative speech and also performative thoughts. In other words, he's not simply interested in describing things or seeing how words may or may not be accurate in describing things. He's also interested in seeing the impact that they have on your mind, on the minds of the people who listen, the mind of the person speaking, and the mind of the person thinking. And that moves on to the, a third quality, which is that the speech be timely. You want your thoughts to be timely as well. Certain truths are useful at certain times and not at other times. Just like certain words can be useful at some times and not at other times. So when realizations come into the mind, you have to ask yourself, to what extent is this true, beneficial, timely? Are there areas where it may not be beneficial, where, where it may not be timely, even if it is true? So you have to be very observant. And the Buddha is talking about not-self, for instance, so he's talking about the three characteristics. You have to know the right time and place for those teachings. There's a sutta where a young monk is asked by a non-Buddhist, a non-Buddhist <coughs> non ascetic, what's the result of action? And the young monk says, all action results in pain, which was a Jain teaching. So this non-Buddhist ascetic knows enough about Buddhism to say, that doesn't sound quite right. You better go check with the Buddha. So the monk goes and checks with the Buddha. And the Buddha calls him a fool. And then another monk steps in and says, well, maybe this monk was thinking about the fact that all feeling is stressful. And the Buddha says, the second monk was a fool too. He so said the first monk was talking, asking about karma, and so he asks her in terms of the three kinds of feeling. There's pleasant feeling. Painful feeling, feeling that's neither pleasant nor painful. And when you're concerned about the results of your actions, those are the kinds of feelings you talk about. You don't go on to the idea that all feelings ultimately are stressful. Because in that case, there would be no idea of what would be a skillful action or an unskillful action. Everything would be painful. So it's a matter of using the right teaching at the right time. And so when you're looking at the ideas that come into your mind or the realizations that come into your mind as you're meditating, it's even more an issue of what's the right time and right place for this. Are these ideas true? Even if they're true, then the question is, are they really beneficial? And is this the right time and place for them? which means that you don't put your 100% stamp of approval on things that come into your meditation, or even things that you read. You have to ask yourself, when is this appropriate, when is it not? You have to learn how to look at the impact of certain kinds of thinking. Certain ideas, even Dharma teachings, can be misused. There's that famous image of the snake. You catch the snake by the tail, it's going to come around and bite you. You have to catch it by the neck. And then even though it may coil back and forth around your arm, it's not going to do you any harm. So 
that's one of the purposes of getting the mind still, is to get in touch with that sense of the mind that's just an observer. That regardless of what happens, it just watches, watches, watches. It's something separate from its object. When you focus on the breath, there comes a point when you begin to realize that at first there's a sense of oneness between your awareness and the breath, and you actually try to cultivate that so you really can be solidly with it. But after all, things begin to separate out. In the same way that when you put oil and vinegar into a bottle and just leave it there, after a while they separate out. Then you try to stay with that sense of the observer as much as possible. Now this too has its time and place. Because you do want to maintain your concentration, and there are times when con concentration requires that you get back into the breath. Work with it. Move it around, and you're in the body, in the breath while you're doing this. If you don't keep this up as a regular practice, you find that your health suffers. You don't have the strength to keep up the meditation. But once you've done the work with the breath, then you let things get as still as possible and allow that sense of the observer to separate out, and then learn how to maintain that. And John Mahabua talks about how when John Munn passed away, he felt lost. Here was the teacher he'd gone to with all of his problems of the mind. Now that teacher was gone. It was like someone who had been depending on a doctor for many years, and all of a sudden the doctor's dead. What do you do? I started reflecting on John Munn's teachings, and one of the ones that came back to him most strongly was that whatever comes up in the mind, if you're not really sure about how safe it is, to stay with your sense of the observer and watch it, and you'll be safe. Step back a bit and just watch what those thoughts, what those ideas, what that kind of knowledge does to the mind. Because even good things can have a bad impact if they come at the wrong time. There's that famous story about the monks practicing contemplation of the body. And their practice veered off in the wrong direction. They started getting really disgusted with the body to the point where they didn't want to live anymore. Some of them committed suicide, some of them hired assassins. The Buddha came back and basically said, hey, where is everybody? When he found out what had happened, they called all the remaining monks together and said, when things get unskillful in the mind, go back to the breath and use the breath to freshen the mind, clear it out. He compared it to a big rain that comes through in the very end of the hot season and clears the air, gets all the dust that's been building up over the months of the hot season and the dry season, clears it out of the air. So you use the breath to clear things out. So you have to notice that sometimes certain insights, an insight into the elements, insight into the aggregates. If you use them in the wrong way, you start thinking, well, there's nobody there. It's just aggregates, just elements. There's nobody here, nobody there. Then you start wondering about, well, what use is it to be good to people if there's no real person there? That kind of thinking goes way off in the wrong direction. So remember that as we're practicing we're not here for the purpose of gaining discernment as the goal. Discernment is one of the actions that we are trying to master, i.e. it has to be seen as performative too. What is it doing to the mind when you hold a particular idea in mind? 
It may be true, but is it beneficial right now? Is this the right time and place for it? These are the questions you always have to ask. And don't be too quick to put your stamp of approval on something. Things have to be tested. But as you develop the stillness of concentration, the stability of mind, it puts you in a much better position to be able to pass judgment on these things. And we are passing judgment. There's so much talk about how bad the judging mind is. But you have to realize there are times when I mean, you have to exercise a lot of judgment in the practice. Just learn how to do it skillfully. Remember, you're looking at actions. Is this a skillful action or not a skillful action? Don't get entangled in issues. Well, am, I, am I a good person? Am I a person with any hope in the meditation? Or am I hopeless? That's the unskillful use of judgment. The skillful use is looking at actions and looking at your state of mind. To what extent can I trust my observations on things? The Buddha did talk about checking things in your own actions. But he also said, check them against the opinions of the wise as well. Because sometimes they look at things with a longer framework. See things from a larger perspective that you might not see immediately. And you want to take their opinions into consideration. There's a sutta where a general comes to the Buddha and asks him, to talk about the benefits of generosity in this lifetime, the implication being that he didn't want to hear about anything beyond this lifetime. So the Buddha gives a list of the benefits that come when you're a generous person, but he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop just with this lifetime. He, wants, he reminds the general there are longer-term consequences, because after all, karma is complex. Sometimes you do something that's unskillful, but you get a reward. The Buddha himself lists cases of her, cases where, say, a man kills the enemy of the king, so the king's going to reward the man. Steals things from the enemy of the king, the king rewards him. Has sex with the wives of the enemy of the king, the king likes that, gives him a reward. Tells an amusing lie to the king that makes the king laugh, the king gives him a reward. In a case like that, you look at the action and you say, well, what is this about the precepts? These actions aren't always unskillful. They're not always leading to pain and suffering. And it says you have to look at things over the long term. There are some immediate results which may not go in line with the general principle of karma, but when you look at things over the long term, you begin to see that the principle of karma really does hold sway. And in his, from his point of view, even seeing things from one lifetime to the next may not be a long enough perspective. Sometimes you do a lot of good things in this lifetime, but you've got a lot of bad karma from a previous lifetime, and in your next lifetime you experience the bad karma from older lifetimes. If all you can see is just this life and the next life, you could under misunderstand things. So remember, you always want to check things not only in your own experience, but also check them with the, the opinions of the wise. Of course, you have to be careful in choosing who you think is wise. But what this means is always be open to the fact there may be a larger perspective that you're not seeing. This is why the Buddha instituted the monastic Sangha in hopes that there would be people around who've had more experience that you can consult with. You can tap into their wisdom. You can tap, tap into their knowledge. So you want to be a person with, with an all-around perspective, learning from your own actions and learning how to put the mind in a position where it can observe things clearly. Observe your physical actions, observe your words, observe your thoughts see how they perform, what they do.
and always be willing to learn from the wise. And that way you come out safe.